Davis, the inmate who maintained his innocence in the murder of a police officer till he took his last breath. There are so many controversial issues about his innocence or guilt. According to the police, Troy Anthony Davis was at a Burger King restaurant with friends and then struck a homeless man named Larry Young in the head with a pistol when Young refused to give a beer to one of Davis's friends. Savannah Police Officer Mark Allen McPhail, who was working an off-duty security detail at the Greyhound bus terminal next door, heard Young cry out and responded to the disturbance. Davis fled and Officer McPhail, wearing his full police uniform, ordered him to stop. Davis turned and shot the officer in the right thigh and chest. Although Officer McPhail was wearing a bulletproof vest, his sides were not protected and the bullet entered the left side of his chest. Davis, smiling walked up to the stricken officer and shot him in the face as he lay dying in the parking lot. No gun was ever found, but shell casings were linked to an earlier shooting for which Davis was convicted. Witnesses placed Davis at the crime scene and identified him as the shooter, but several of them recanted their accounts years later. At midnight on August 18, 1989, Mark Allen McPhail, a Savannah police officer, reported for work as a security guard at the Greyhound bus station in Savannah, adjacent to a fast food restaurant. A few hours later, as the Burger King restaurant was closing, a fight broke out in which Davis struck a homeless man in the head with a pistol. The next afternoon, Davis told a friend that he had been involved in an argument at the restaurant the previous evening and struck someone with a gun. He told the friend that when a police officer ran up, Davis shot him and that he went to the officer and finished the job because he knew the officer got a good look at his face when he shot him the first time. After his arrest, Davis told a cellmate a similar story. A shell casing that was found at the scene of the murder was linked to the Cloverdale Drive shooting. A woman who was staying in a hotel across the street from where Mark McPhail was murdered identified Troy Davis as the shooter after seeing a photograph of him. She also chose his photo from a five-person lineup as well as identified him at his trial. Numerous other eyewitnesses also identified Davis. At approximately 1 a.m. on Saturday, August 19, 1989, officers of the Savannah Police Department responded to a call of an officer down at the Greyhound bus station. Officers found Mark McPhail a 27-year-old Savannah police officer, lying face down in the parking lot of the Burger King restaurant next to the bus station. Officer McPhail's mouth was filled with blood and bits of his teeth were on the sidewalk. As he began administering CPR to the victim, Officer Owens noticed that the victim's firearm was still snapped into his holster. Sylvester Red, Cole S., saw Young leave the pool hall next door and began following Young demanding a beer. Cole continued to harass Mr. Young all the way back to the Burger King. When Young arrived at the parking lot, Harriet Murray was sitting on a low wall by the restaurant. Davis and Daryl Collins, who had taken a shortcut to the parking lot, came out from behind the bank and surrounded Mr. Young. Mr. Coles, who was facing Mr. Young, told him not to walk away cause you don't know me, I'll shoot you, and began digging in his pants. Miss Murray ran to the back door of the Burger King, which was locked. Davis, who was behind Young and to his right, blindsided him striking him on the side of the face with a snub-nosed pistol, 
inflicting a severe head injury. Mr. Young began to bleed profusely, and he stumbled to a van parked in front of the Burger King drive-in window, asking the occupants for help. When the driver did not respond, he went to the drive-in window, but the manager shut it in his face. In response to the disturbance in the parking lot, Officer McPhail, who was working as a security guard at the restaurant, walked rapidly from behind the bus station, with his nightstick in his hand, and ordered the three men to halt. Mr. Collins and Davis fled, and Officer McPhail ran past Sylvester Coles in pursuit of Davis. Davis looked over his shoulder, and when the officer was five to six feet away, shot him. Officer McPhail fell to the ground, and Davis walked towards him and shot him again while he was on the ground. The victim died of gunshot wounds before help arrived. Davis fled to Atlanta the following day and surrendered to authorities on August 23, 1989. Pursuant to an investigation, police learned that on the night of the killing, Davis had attended a party on Cloverdale Drive, in a subdivision near Savannah. During the party, Davis, annoyed that some girls ignored him, told several of his friends something about burning them. Davis then walked around saying, I feel like doing something, anything. When Michael Cooper and his friends were leaving the party, Davis was standing out front. Michael Cooper was in the front passenger seat, and as the car pulled away, several of the men in the car leaned out the window shouting and throwing things. Davis shot at the car from a couple of hundred feet away and the bullet shattered the back windshield and lodged in Michael Cooper's right jaw. Cooper was treated at the hospital and released and Cooper's injury formed the basis for Count IV of Davis indictment. The shooting incident took place approximately one hour before Officer McPhail was shot. Davis was found guilty of one count of malice murder, one count of obstruction of a law enforcement officer, two counts of aggravated assault and one count of possession of firearm during the commission of a felony. The jury's recommendation of a death sentence was returned on August 30, 1991. Of the nine witnesses who appeared at Davis's 1991 trial, who said they had seen Davis beating up a homeless man, in a dispute over a bottle of beer and then shooting to death a police officer. Mark McPhail, who was acting as a good Samaritan, seven have since recanted their evidence. One of those who recanted, Antoine Williams, subsequently revealed they had no idea who shot the officer, and that they were illiterate, meaning they could not read. The police statements that they had signed at the time of the murder in 1989. Others said they had falsely testified that they had overheard Davis confess to the murder. Many of those who retracted their evidence said that they had been cajoled by police into testifying against Davis. Some said they had been threatened with being put on trial themselves if they did not cooperate. Of the two of the nine key witnesses, who have not changed their story publicly, one has kept silent for the past 20 years and refuses to talk, and the other is Sylvester Coles. Coles was the man who first came forward to police and implicated Davis as the killer. But over the past 20 years evidence has grown that Coles himself may be the gunman and that he was fingering Davis to save his own skin. In total, nine people have come forward with evidence that implicates Coles. Most recently, the George Board of Pardons and Paroles heard from Quiana Glover, who told the panel that in June 2009, 
She had heard Coles, who had been drinking heavily, confess to the murder of MacPhail. Apart from the witness evidence, most of which has since been cast into doubt, there was no forensic evidence gathered that links Davis to the killing. In particular, there is no DNA evidence of any sort. The human rights group The Constitution Project points out that three quarters of those prisoners who have been exonerated and declared innocent in the U.S. were convicted at least in part on the basis of faulty eyewitness testimony. No gun was ever found connected to the murder. Coles later admitted that he owned the same type of 38 caliber gun that had delivered the fatal bullets but that he had given it away to another man earlier on the night of the shooting. Higher courts in the U.S. have repeatedly refused to grant Davis a retrial, on the grounds that he had failed to prove his innocence. His supporters counter that where the ultimate penalty is at stake, it should be for the courts to be beyond any reasonable doubt of his guilt. Even if you set aside the issue of Davis's innocence or guilt, the manner of his execution is cruel and unnatural. It would be the fourth scheduled execution date for Davis. In 2008 he was given a stay just 90 minutes before he was set to die. Experts in death row say such multiple experiences with imminent death is tantamount to torture. The Georgia Supreme Court unanimously affirmed Davis convictions and death sentence on February 26, 1993. After being given several execution dates prior. On September 6, 2011, the Superior Court of Chatham County filed an order setting the seven-day window in which the execution of Troy Anthony Davis may occur to begin at noon on September 21, 2011, and ending seven days later at noon on September 28, 2011. The Commissioner of the Department of Corrections then set the specific date and time for the execution as 7 p.m. on September 21, 2011. Davis has concluded his direct appeal proceedings and his state and federal habeas corpus proceedings. On September 21, 2011, he was executed at Georgia Diagnostic and Classification State Prison. He was 42 years at his time of execution. His final words were, I'd like to address the McPhail family. Let you know, despite the situation you are in, I'm not the one who personally killed your son, your father, your brother. I am innocent. The incident that happened that night is not my fault. I did not have a gun. All I can ask, is that you look deeper into this case so that you really can finally see the truth. I ask my family and friends to continue to fight this fight. For those about to take my life, God have mercy on your souls. And may God bless your souls. Thank you for watching Death Row.